Blog Talk Radio. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, world? It's badass thugging like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. Blech. Yo, yo, check this out. This is your girl, Cola Coke, and I'm chilling with my boys right here on Off the Cuff Radio. We off the cuff right now. You big? Well, uh, uh-oh. What's up? What's up? It's your boy Lil Yap with UNLV. Bragging them from the river. Cooling with my homies and my family at Off the Cuff Radio. Y'all be sure to tune in on Fridays and get the latest scoop and find out what's happening. You hoit me? Tiffany and this Queen Queens is your girl's favorite bartender. And we're from Sex on the Rocks Podcast. All right, you're now tuning in to Off the Cuff Radio. Yeah, because they keep representing that world of hip hop. Yo, much love. All right. Hey, y'all, this is Princess Daisy giving a shout out to King Eric and Off the Cuff Radio. Keep doing your thing, puppy. Ooh. Hey y'all, this is Stacey Lachey, giving a shout out to King Eric and Off the Cuff Radio. What's shaking, y'all? This is the grand. One half of Lost Cause and one third of that drive time thing. Sending my love to the homies over at Off the Cuff Radio. Tune in every Friday night for some real, still hip-hop conversation. These dudes are the connoisseurs of this thing. You already know what it is. BX Stand Up, Hud City, we're shaking. Peace. Yo, this is Joe Fresh to Dine, and y'all tuned in to the most raw, uncut show on radio. The guillotine team, Off the Cuff. And yo, Eric Sandman, Off the Cuff. Drunk or hot talk, no typewriter start box, no 45 now box. Oh, Louis attack, follow me. Original gun come to boom it up. Louis ranking, they am my friend. Original gun come to boom it up. The sweet daddy him come back again. Dan dada, now he's a super cat man, you a dan dada. Me fling two stab under the boy with the bama. Me lick up ninja man front teeth with a hammer. The gun where me fire man, it is a typewriter. And we part. Me come from the rock boat, Warwick and me barn And me grow in a the ghetto slump era The gun where me have man, it don't carry trigger You press two button and a pure shot fire Me anna fi me mama and me anna fi me dada Say so that me days not the dreadlock will be longer And these are the words of the mighty mighty Jaja Who sit up in a Zion in a sweet Ethiopia And a Jaja fling lightning and Jaja dash thunder Make every man and then Jaja make the daughter Come for me, come for me Original gun come to boom it up Sweet daddy him come back again Original gun come to boom it up The sweet daddy him come back again First Dan Dada Now he's a super cat man Are you a Dan Dada Me fling two stab under the boy with the bama Me lick up ninja man front teeth with a hammer And the gun when me fire man it is a typewriter And we part me come from the rock boat Parik and me barn and me go in a the ghetto slump area Me nice up seat up fix up man I feel your little neighbor The gun when me have man it don't carry trigger You press two button and a pure shot fire And people start run some of them start flat All the ranking at the DJ at the control tower Come follow me Come follow me, original gun come to boom it up The sweet daddy him come back again Original gun come to boom it up The sweet daddy him come back again Dan Dada, now he's a super cat man Are you a Dan Dada, but me fling two stab under the boy with the bama Me lick out ninja man front teeth with a hammer The gun when me fire man, it is a typewriter And we part, me come from the rock boat Where he come me born, and me grew in a ghetto slum area And I feel me mama, me and I feel me dada Say so that me days, not the dreadlock will be longer Say these are the words of the mighty mighty Jaja Who sit up in a Zion in a sweet Ethiopia The gun when me have man, it don't carry trigger You press two buttons and a pure shot fire And one get shot and the body start flatter Well, we're ranking dog out and him there Hey, 
Me say that me them call say boom it up. Original gun come back again. Me say that me them call say boom it up. Original gun come back again. Dan dada. Now if you super cat man, you a dan dada. But we fling to stab and that the boy with the bama. We lick up ninja man front teeth with the hammer. The gun when me fire man, it is a type of writer. Me anna fi me mama and me anna fi me dada. I do teach me this man. I put my baby culture when me come in at the dance that the roots and culture. Me like some sweet to fix up man. I feel your little area. Me come in the dance and pick up the mic. You know that's a danger. Come follow me. Come follow me. Come on. Original gun come to boom it up. Sweet daddy him come back again. Original gun come to boom it up. The sweet daddy him come back again. Hey, hey, Dan dada. Now he's a super cat man. Are you a Dan dada? We fling to stab and that the boy with the bummer. Me lick up ninja man. Front teeth with a hammer. The gun when me fire man. It is a type of writer. And we part me come. The original Jamaican down that I put up a frequency. I know boy I couldn't take that down back. Enough guy come this and attack. I want to know. The original Jamaican down Why you better know what you say? Know who you dissing? Watch what you're talking. The down that with a gun is coming. So man you better know what you say. Know who you're dissing Watch what you're talking The Dan Dada with your gun is coming Said I was riding through the ghetto With a 45 in my hand And anything says My God I tell you Six foot under the sun So boy you better know what you say Know who you're dissing Watch what you're talking The Dan Dada with your gun is coming Boy, oh, you fit us so when we have we got some magic over pocket and then clap it, make your up like a rabbit, blow the leak out while your family leave the scene with while you're chopping, pan the bus steadily laughing, people wondering what's happening, while you're mad about your coughing, man, I can't stop you talking from your talking, and if I'm a from people who was watching, delivering, shivering, spinning them and spinning from the automatic where we be talking, boy, see it get leaker, soon as the hotel, pop, 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 boom, the war is fucking on, so you better start, ring the alarm before we make the priest. Start read you a psalm, we broke your left arm from the Teflon. Boom, 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 boost the wall, them dead in a bush. I owe that, I weed that. You know the black and the lag with the automatic cock box. Ah! Why you better know what you say? Know who you dissing? Watch what you talking? The gun that with a gun is coming. So man, you better know what you say. Know who you dissing? Watch what you talking? The gun that with a gun is coming. Said I was riding through the ghetto with a 45 in my hand. And anything test, my God, I tell you, six foot under the sun. So boy, you better know what you say. Know who you dissing. Watch what you talking. The gun that with a gun is coming. Holy God, it's your boy King Eric the Great, aka Rick Capo, and we are now at episode 256 at Off the Cuff Radio, sponsored by Buddy Boy Entertainment and Da Vinci Clothing. And I have my host of the evening, T Max, with the facts in the building. We in for another one. Man, what it is, what it is, King. Another Friday night of fabulous. And for our listeners tonight, we have an extra, extra special. Special guest. Um, we're going to take it down, you know, yard, you know, down Jamaica, man, and we're going to, we, we're going to, we're going to interview one of the, to call this man a legend is an understatement. Um, for what hip hop, for all, for all of you, for all our listeners who are old enough to remember, you know, when dance hall reggae was really beginning to take hold in the early 90s, you know, 
this man along with Ninja Man, Shava Rank, you know, um, Louis Rankin is one of the true, you know, pioneers of the dance hall movement. And as far as we're concerned, he is the top shot of original Don Dada toughest down yard. And, oh, man, this is, this is an honor and a privilege to have him with us tonight. Oh, man. Yeah, this is going down as one of our most legendary shows right here because to say this man isn't a pioneer is an understatement. So with that being said, we're going to bring him on. Louis Rankin, a.k.a. Osborne Belly, a.k.a. the original Jamaican Don Dada, right here with us. What up? What up? I want. I want. Hey, I am. That adjustment a little bit. The fireworks then came on, so I gotta fix that. Make sure everything is good. I am. Man, we, Mr. We Rankin. In the this building. Is... Yeah. I am the original Javier Candandara. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Man. Man, I mean, we got two hours, Mr. Rankin. We we are so honored. I mean, you, man, you, you yeah, man. I yo, you know what? I, I took this time really because I know about your program and I respect this program. You know what I mean? So I said, you know what? I have to make sure I be. I'm supposed to be going somewhere, but I said I'm gonna take time. To be with y'all, man, and my people out there, man, because it's my love there, yo, man. I have to be with the love, man, because united we stand divided, we fall down. Definitely, we man, you know, that, from the man. island. That's yeah, you man, know, I'm just like, just saying, man, I, it's an honor to be speaking with y'all, to be honestly, before I even say anything, I just want to let y'all know that I appreciate the love. I appreciate the love that y'all got for me, and I appreciate myself for the love that I got for y'all, but it's much love, man. What's going on, yo? The original Dan Dada here, you know, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I never fear any evil. That's why I'm here. Y'all saw belly. They cut my throat, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you I went out shooting, though. You went out shooting. <laughs> you definitely. Yeah. I, I was like, I was, t- I was talking with T Max about that, man. We was like, this man literally smoked a pound, got drunk, and still took out a damn <laughs> army on the on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> King, you're supposed to be, if you in your in your throne, that's your house. You're supposed to be a king in there. And you cannot have people just run up in there and take it out either. That means you ain't no king in that house. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. It, it, no, nah, man. That's one of the, because we're going to get to that too, Louis, because that movie, uh, because there's a lot of history behind the movie, behind Belly, and of course, most notably Shadows, um, you know, which your characters, of course, Ox and Belly has become one of the, you know, and, you know, uh, we're, me, King, our co-hosts who aren't here with us but are listening, you know, Sandman and uh, Chinchilla, we're all big movie buffs. And Belly, you know, when we first heard about Belly, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but seeing we're on it, we might as well get to that. But we're definitely coming back to your origins. But with Belly, Belly, when we first heard about it in late 1997, that Hype Williams, you know, the acclaimed, of course, the acclaimed movie director, um, he was doing a crime drama. We just didn't know it was going to have all of y'all in it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Man. 
I know, I know. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what? You know what, though? I, like, mm-hmm. I wouldn't know me because I was, like, them time when Belly happened, I was, like, I was with Mesa Record, um, uh, part of Warner Brothers. They were there, well, um, Atlantic Record, that, that company now, but... What happened right. is like I was I was I was like one of the hardest thing in dance all them time and hype actually know me personally but um I know his people, I know his work, what he was doing because he was a very he was the top video um director um uh, for like rappers and stuff in them time, you know what I mean? So Yeah. Yeah, I was doing. I was actually to be happy. Since we talking about Belly, I'm gonna tell you what happened with me with Belly. Um, I was doing a con. I was doing a concert one night in Queens, New York, um, at a place called Ligony, and I was in there, you know, performing on stage. And as soon as I finished my set, I was coming off the stage, and the security guard stopped me and says, there is a woman insists to see you. Her name was um, Winsome Sinclair. Eh? She was like the casting director for that movie. Um, I sent her to find me because I found out that I was going to be at that venue that night. I didn't expect this thing, man. And um, it was so... <laughs> it's like I couldn't understand it because when I, I when they told me that she wants to talk to me, I said, "Who is Winsome Sinclair?" You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm a you know, I'm a top DJ, but gangster rapper and all that. So I'm thinking, you know, yeah, what is what's going on? Why is this woman insist to see me? So I told them I went to the backstage and I told them bring this woman to me, and she came. And Winsome said to me, do you know Ike Williams? And I said, of course, everybody know Ike Williams, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. So I said, everybody know Ike Williams. And she says, well, Hype insists to see you on Monday. The, 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 the party was, the, the concert was that Saturday night. And she says, I right. would love to see you on Monday downtown. Yeah. And she gave, I said, where? And she said, I'm going to give you the address. He said, I said, what it's about? She didn't want to tell me. So I know hype. So I took the address. Jump in my mm-hmm. whip on Monday morning. And I run, went down there, went to a big building down um, downtown Manhattan, lower Manhattan, and went upstairs up there. I saw a bunch of people. I standing there waiting for me and he pulled me and took me into a room by myself and he says I got a role for you I'm making you the black Scarface you know what I'm saying saying. I say what you talking about the only Scarface Scarface is my favorite movie and that's a movie and he said that's what it is I'm doing a movie called Belly and the role that I want you to play is just going to be like Al Pacino type of stuff because I see you as that person. So I just wrote that, and, and I wanted you to play that. So I didn't do a cast. Oh, wow. I said, okay. I said, I'm down with that. So he took some information from me. I left. And then I have a lawyer, one of the biggest lawyer, entertainment lawyer in New York. His name is Bruce Jackson. So... Um, they called Bruce. They called Bruce Jackson and gave Bruce Jackson some paperwork and let them know what it is. And guess what? Three days after, I have to be on set, so I have to sign that. I have, I have to sign that D like the next day. Eh? But when I heard Hollywood and I and this hype Williams, there's no way I'm gonna say no, eh? And then you gonna tell me about I'm playing a Scarface role? I'm not gonna say no, eh? Cause that's me. I'm the real Scarface. So uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it is true. So um, I went to my lawyer's office. Boom, I was on set. The next thing, when I went on set, I saw DMX. I saw Nas. I saw Meth. I saw Terrell X. I saw t I saw everybody, you know what I mean? Because to me... I, I, the way I Williams already arranged the movie and cast everybody already. I'm the last person he cast, and I'm the main character in the movie. So it was like the most biggest moment of my career, the most biggest moment of my life is belly. You know what I mean? And it's like 
he gave me a little script book and he says, listen, this is your script. Um, you can change it and put it any way you want, but just look at the script and then you'll get the idea, but do it your way, the Jamaican way. And that's all I wanted to hear. Then, then another thing, I looked at the script and they, my character name was Brad, was supposed to be Brad. So I called Hype with him. I say, yo, Hype, ain't no gangster named Brad. That sounds really <laughs> stupid, like a, a nerd name, man. But why am I going to be named Brad? So he says, name what you want. Give me the name. I write it down right now. DMX walk up and say, Lennox. So I just say, I right, Ox. Yeah. And that's how I got that name branded on me, man. Ox, yeah. Then, man. the movie continued. We had fun. To be honest with you, we had fun. You know, especially the shooting scene because the, um, the shooting scene was actually real guns. All the, it was all real guns in Belly. So, but it was from the government. Like, you know, the feds came on set because, especially my scene, because I was firing a, a assault, high powered AK 47 rifle. And so they, yeah. they had to be there. And um, yeah. it's like, it's like, I fired the gun, I'm like 155 pounds at that time, and I'm firing this gun like easy. Even when I was standing up in the mansion, I pointed up in the ear and said, who want to test me? And I, I fired it one hand. When I finished this scene, the feds actually called me in a room and questioned me, asking me, you fired guns before? Those type of guns, I says, not that type. Would I fire a lot of guns? They says, where do you fire them? I says, on the range. <laughs> <laughs> like where else? <laughs> I just shut them up right there. Yeah, I fired them on the range. Um, so I Billy, mean, Billy was like Billy. Billy was. I think I did a lot of. I did movie after that that like shotters and I loved them, but. I think Billy was the greatest experience in my career after music. I think Billy was a, one of my great experiences. I think Billy was a message. Billy was um, damages because I made a lot of kids start smoking weed because I really promote a lot of weed in this movie. And I like, and every you know, kids start smoking. They were saying things about me, bad things about me. But bad publicity is good publicity because Billy become the biggest blockbuster movie, you know, one at a time, man. Because even now, I'm still getting paid for Billy. So Billy is the belly you know, of the beast. You know what I mean? Definitely. You know what? You know, um, you know, Mr. Rankin, and it's something because when you're looking at Certain, like I said, certain movies, you know, like I said earlier, certain characters are just immortalized. And you're telling us, you're telling us this story, and we're just like awestruck about it because, I mean, we when we watch for all of, for everybody who saw Scarface in 1983, that um, that action sequence. Because when we, uh, you know, when the, when the whole, you know, because everybody knows during that movie, you know, when, every, when the shit start breaking down and then you do the, the you know, the old Jesus saying, send Shakita. Because I was in the theater that night, it opened. So we all looking at each other like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we, we see that girl walk in and we were like, that's the, and they were like, wait a minute, they're calling her and she's the hit woman. We were like, oh, this is about to be some shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, I even seen it when I even seen when we was watching in the movie that theater because we was in the theaters that night when that movie came out, and I knew when you when you dropped the phone and you dropped the camera, you saw the people running in. That was some scary stuff right there. You see people running your man. I I didn't I didn't even know my eyes could have popped open when I looked at the movie I, because I saw Ike Williams. Ike Williams. Fell and they had to cut it. They had to cut it because I when when I dropped the thing and the way my eye popped and I went down and pulled that thing from under the couch. I William actually fell out laughing and cut and cut it. The whole shit got disturbed, eh? Yeah. So how how many how many yeah. takes did it take to shoot that sequence? So did y'all pretty much get that in one take? Uh no, that that's impossible. That take about um, all night. 
And till okay. the next morning, when it get bright, then we had to go back the next night because that mansion there got like 14 bedrooms. That's a huge house, eh? And there's people coming from different angles of the house. So I had to shoot everybody that coming in. And for me to do all that, man, it would be like a lot too much work for me that way. So they had to cut some scenes and say, all right, we do it a couple of hours the next scene on the house because the house is huge, eh? So it's right. like, you know, it was over 30 something people I done knock over in the house, like, so it's a lot of people. So it's like, they come <laughs> they, <laughs> they was coming from different angles. And I amazed Ipe, man. Ipe is so disappointed because he wanted to even do, redo the, the, another one. And I don't know what happened. Game did something. I don't know what happened because they was actually planning to really like when the ambulance came to that house. I was my throat was bleeding, but I actually was still alive. You know, they was trying to make it like that because of the work that I did with that movie, and they realized that movie could have did a lot of sequence uh, sequels. So they he's like disappointed so much in that. You know, what I mean, he didn't want it. He said, "Man, I shouldn't have let you get killed." You know, yeah. Yeah, you know, but, um, but he, now... he, he he was trying. He was trying to create a way that. I actually, actually never died, but it never happened. So, but you know, it might happen. To be honest with you, because you know, I don't want to talk too much about it because I'm not allowed to. So, understood, understood. Because there was, and I was going to ask you some questions about that, uh, but I, but I was going to refrain. I'm just going to tell our listeners, uh, King Magazine around 2006, it did a story, you know, in terms of that movie's in terms of the production with the movie, um, this is just what was written, and there were, and I'm not going to, of course, on the air, you know, speak on that. We may talk about that off the air. But, uh, but I know that there was some, you know, there was some stuff going on with the production, and some people wondered about why did the movie end the way that it did, because it was kind of like it went from one place, you know, with Tommy, of course, being DMX's character. What movie? What movie is that? What movie? I, I lost Belly. you. What movie? Belly. 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 Belly, yes, sir. Yes, sir, because there was some uh, – because King Magazine did a story about it in terms of the production, in terms of with height, and some of the things that had happened with it in terms of just – there were some issues with the production um, going along with it, you know, just in terms of uh, a lot of things happening with it. Um, well, you to, be there, you, yeah, to be right, honest with you – yeah, to be honest with you – I was on production. I saw everything. Um, I'm not saying it. whatever you do in any job, in any business, man, there is problem. But the problem, I don't know about it. Never try to know about it. I have a contract, and gotcha. and, and everybody, gotcha. DMX had a contract. Meth, we all had contracts. Everybody got paid. Everybody got paid. But I just know one problem that happened in Jamaica we were supposed to do the beach scene where I took DMX, and that never happened. And the reason why that never happened, we got there too late. And that was the next right. problem because he was stuck in the hotel doing his fuck his shit that he always do. You know what I mean? So I, I, you know what I mean? And I have to say that. But to be honest with you, I from from the day I get on set, I seen work done, work done. But yes, the problem was there. There might there might be a few problems there, but I don't think it was major. But it was kept low because I think it was what John right. Stocks or Sparks the uh, producer for that um, and I think what happened could be the problem that after because of so much expense spending and the budget was at certain level and everybody have to get a certain amount of money there was some little budget so they probably went in and have to re pull some more money on the budget. That was maybe one of the problems. But I don't think that should be any issue for them people to talk about. You understand? It's a production and then guess what happened? Belly make one million times more than that. Eh? So so you see what I'm saying? You can't look at stuff like that. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Because um, the movie ended up being like a cold classic, but it, it ended for real. Cause you man, know, it Belly, listen me. Listen, uh, yeah, listen to me. Not even Scarface or The Godfather 
selling in Walmart or those stores like Belly, man. Belly is selling. You know, I, I'm, I'm out here doing everything because right now I'm up in the game right now like strong, eh? And it's like everywhere I go, I got, I've got, seen kid like 15, 16. He's the man from Belly. He's the man from Belly. They wasn't even born when Belly was made. So, you know what I mean? Come on. It's like, you know. Belly's a trade. Belly's a trademark. It's gonna be stamped. It's, it's a trademark, and it's gonna be there for the rest of the life, just like Scarface, just like Godfather, just like a few dollars more. Good, the bad, and the ugly. Clint Eastwood. That Belly is classic, and it's gonna stay there. It's in the Hall of Fame when it comes to movies. So you know, what I mean, it oh, yeah. made it. It made it. It made it. Yeah. Most definitely. Most definitely. And, if you ain't check all- out Belly on Netflix, you missing out. You better check it out right now. I'm I'm putting the stamp on it right now. And I mean, and there, and you know, and you know, Mr. Rankin. In terms of you know, the not only the movie but the soundtrack was insane. I was like, when I saw the when I saw the the, the soundtrack. Well, you know what, you know what, you know what. I'm gonna just go make my point straight so the whole world can hear me, the original Jamaican dancer, that speak on Belly. Belly is go ahead, in. Go ahead. The hip belly is the movie that stamp the hip hop Bible of success. Remember mm. that? Oh my God! <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> Say that again. Be- no, I repeat. No, no, I repeat. I repeat. The original Jamaican dance that says belly is the movie that create the history of. The hip hop Bible. Oh, Ram Pudway. But uh, you know, but um, when you look at it, that movie even over twenty years later is still so influential. But before Ox, you know, before Teddy Bruxa, because we got to talk about, you know, because we got to talk about this movie that was, you know, bootleg but became another phenomenon, which was shot of, you know. But let's uh, but before we get to that. Tell us about your origins in terms of, you know, where you came from and how you found your way into music. Uh, well, I was born in uh, the eastern part of Jamaica called St. Thomas, and I grew up in a city called Rockfort, which is a very dangerous, one of the toughest places in Kingston, Jamaica. I hmm. was, I start music out at the age of about 10, always into music, always loved music, and always loved new movie because I was a big fan of Clint Eastwood when I was a little kid. I like Western movies, eh? Because I like those big long guns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I try like... <laughs> so I'm um, like... I just love, um, you know... Um, are you feeling lucky today? You know what I mean? So, and all that type of stuff. I was into those stuff. And um, music-wise, I started out in Jamaica as a young dancehall artist, you know, Louis Rankin. And my my migration, my first migrated from Jamaica was Canada. And I came to Canada, and I never happy with the entertainment business at that time in Canada. So I then migrated myself to my home, the favorite place I love, you know what I mean? Brooklyn, New York City. BK! Yeah, I grind the streets of Brooklyn, you know, in the 90s, because I used to run the 90s, run through the 90s, uh, East 95th, Rutland, you know, New Las Avenue, all that. We run through the whole of that. And you know, Flatbush Avenue, we run through there. We was I'm just then I grew up and all I was doing is just freestyling and going to these little club and making the DJ give me the mic, you know what I mean? And I was just like DJing for free and everybody knowing who I am then and I was like the Don the little Don out in the street, you know what I mean? That's why I said I am the original Don Dada because I started with that from a long, long time ago. So I just run through there. Then they have like Gil Bailey. Then I, 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 my first couple of records, when I dropped my first couple of records, Gil Bailey started playing it on a local radio in New York City, which is Manhattan. <laughs> then I start 
ripping down fall apart because I'm going into it and uh, my name start ringing and ringing and ringing. But in the meantime, I was doing this on my own. I have no manager. I don't know how to get to a label. I don't know how to do nothing. All I was using is my talent in the street. And I just keep, I was very persistible. So I use persistent. Then I end up, Start knowing people like Funk Master Flex. I'm start knowing people like Kid Capri. I'm start knowing these people that I'm getting into the game and into the game. And man, I don't know, man. You know the the the, um, the bee with the honey just pitched on me. And um, Jim Snowden was driving in a limousine that always take me to my concert. Jim Snowden is the owner of the company of Mesa Record in Burbank. California. He came to New York City, and after the, um, I was dominating dance all those times for real though. And um, he came there and drove in a limo that drive me to all my concert because the owner of the limo, the husband, um, the wife of the owner of the limo was my manager at the same time. So he rode in there and he heard a couple of dance hall live cassettes that was playing in the limo and he jumped up and he he pulled the divider of the limousine and asked my driver who is this man on this cassette tape the radio plane or whatever and he explained who i was the man gave him a card and and says give it to him and ask him please to call me i ask his lawyer to call me and then i didn't call him Um, i let my manager call him and the next thing you know I was signed to Mesa Record. The next thing you know, I did this song, Typewriter. I did the remix on Typewriter. Um, Track Masters was the producers, which Track Masters was the biggest production company yeah. back in the year. Red, Red yeah, Red Hot Red, Red, yeah. Red, Red, Love Tone and all them, yeah. And um, the song went viral, man. And then I, the album was called Showdown. That was the first album, man. It sold out. The next one I did was Lethal Weapon, sold out again. And the next thing I know, it was Ike William kidnapping me for belly. Yeah. And yeah. then I never oh, stopped. I, was... I, ne- I never stopped. Yeah. And that tight rider remix was crazy, man. That used to get so much bump through the East Coast, through those, through those clue tapes. Oh, and yeah, yeah. I was like, damn, that remix was the dumb hard. Hard man, but yeah, I'm a hard I mean, person. I'm a hard person. I'm a very hard person in the things I do to make it happen, you know. But when it comes to my family, though, and my kids, I'm very soft. I can't say that, you know. And I want the world to know that, you know, I'm soft, you know. But when it comes to my kids, my babies, and stuff, because I love them, you know. But when when I step through that door, you know, what I mean. Uh, you know, I'm like the ox, the small ox that right. will cut trees down, uh, cut it down, yeah. Now, hey, do you care now, to tell the difference Miss... between the hip-hop clubs and the dance hall clubs for a lot of people that was trying to get in tune with, with you in that era? Because you came up around the older era, the OG era, and you care to tell us the difference between the dance hall scene and the hip-hop scene? Because I know you've been through both. Well, to be honest with you, the dance hall scene, I do dominate that. And, and 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 if you understand, to be honest with you, the real hip-hop culture it started out in Jamaica because Jamaica started rap a long time ago. It's just because we use a different accent and different type of tracks. But we started all that out. So now... I'm doing work with so many artists. I even do collaboration with Gucci, man. I do collaboration with, with a lot of most rappers because I'm getting, I get calls like uh, millions of calls from rappers in America every day it wants me to do feature or drop or something because hip hop and dancehall is what run the world. And it, it, it comes right now to a point where if if it's not if you hear hip hop you go into a club and you don't hear dance hall in there, that club is whack. Yeah. Definitely. 
And, um, you know, what, Mr. Rankin, it's definitely something, too, where what you say about, you know, the Jamaican, uh, where Jamaica laid down the blueprint for hip-hop and, uh, you know, rap music is absolutely true because a lot of people forget this. DJ Cool Herc, you know, of the Bronx, he's from Jamaica, and he was the one to – he was the one that would lay down that foundation with the two turntables and the microphone. They would ultimately exactly, you know, turn to the exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, now when we now when we look at the time of it, because a lot of times because the Jamaican accent is, you know, for some hard to understand. So, but when you but when I was reading the lyrics for Typewriter. Those lyrics go as hard as any battle rap song because, and I wanted to ask you about the situation with Ninja Man and uh, Super Cat. Was that more or less a competition that you had with those guys, or was there some moderate tension between you all of what was going on at the time, you know, for Dance Hall Supremacy? Because this was during a time in the 1990s, you know, of course, from – you know, of course, Teddy Riley started a new Jack Swing to where, you know, Puffy was bringing in more blending that hip-hop and R&B. And then, of course, the dance hall was really beginning to come in, you know. Uh, and, I mean, it was – I mean, the stuff you all did during that period was just unbelievable. I mean, whew. But, uh, but yeah, was there any issues with uh, Super Cat and uh, Ninja Man with you, or was that just well? Um, I, I I have a few problems with Super Cat, and uh, I have a few rivalry with Super Cat, Ninja Man. I have rivalry like competition rivalry clashes with Ninja Man, but Ninja Man and Louis Rankin, which is me, we don't take mm-hmm. it personal. We don't take it gotcha. personal. Um, we get on stage. Me and Ninja Man was two entertainers back in the days that don't matter who you are or how tough you are and good you are, you have to step to us on stage and we wipe you out. And if we don't wipe you out and you wipe us out, you are good. And it never happened. So no one wins clashes like me and Ninja Man back in the days. Not Shabba. Not nobody. We write them off. If you can look back in dance hall history, if you go on YouTube, you see Downbeat. You can see the difference between me and Ninja Man. Every entertainer from Super Cat to all of them, I'm not saying Super Cat's scared physically or mentally, but he's scared to face us professionally like that. But he's the type that get issues within himself like he think he's tough and he's with that attitude. And I'm just speaking on that. He's a good friend of mine, eh? Super cat. But I'm telling you how he is. Yeah, he's bad temper. And he's like, he's like, um, who was like that? Um, I think Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali used to get him mad just to beat him up and all that when they fight. Super cat is right. one of them. Like Mike, like Mike Tyson. My, uh, you get your, if you get super cat mad, he don't focus on the mic or something. Just like the class with Ninja Man and Super Cat in Jamaica, you know, because Super Cat was fire and Super Cat could stand up to Ninja Man. He could, okay. And but Ninja Man talk so much things to him to get Super Cat mad and stuff like that. And Super Cat did not focus on what he come there to do. He just go into something as cause he probably thinking in a bad temper or that type because he yeah, um, Super Cat is not no punk eh, in real life. So he he takes that on stage and I think that's what could could um damage Super Cat. But Cat is one of the best DJ I think in the dance hall too. So I, I give it to Cat all the way too, you know what I mean? But is that's how it was. Back in the days, it was like it's just clash. We come with our competition against each other on stage because people love those things those days and people love to watch that, you know, especially if they know, like, me going up against Ninja Man, you're going to get uh, 20, 30,000 people in that park or whatever because they want to see that. You feel me? You know, and uh, yeah. but some of the uh, some of the artists used to take it so personal, like even Shaba. You know, he took it personal one time. Ninja Man, um, 
um, knocked him out in a, on stage, and I think Reggae Son splashed, and he take it personally, you know, get end up crying, all that stuff, man. It's, it's uh, you know, <laughs> but this is a business, man. <laughs> That's like, that it is, is like yeah. battle, it's like battle rapping. It's like you going on the stage and you show and improve your skills and letting people know like if you if you really battle the night. Right. Like battle right. I myself, me and Ninja Man, we used to love it because I don't care if I lose a clash, but we, actually, I never lost none. You know what I mean? But I don't care. I, I, I don't care if I. I don't care if I lose. You know, I just loved it. I love the competition, and I will accept my loss. I'm not the type that you know I'm gonna get uh, violent or get mad because you know what I mean. And I'm glad I'm not that type because if I was that type, I wouldn't care about none of them because I ain't scared of nobody. That's the bottom line. Man, um, but. And, and, you know, this is, you know, the history that you're giving us, Mr. Rankin, is just so rich because a lot of people to this day still don't know and I don't think fully understand and appreciate how much Jamaican, you know, culture, you know, influenced hip-hop. This is Off the Cuff Radio on Blog Talk Radio with King Eric, the ruler, myself, T-Max of the Facts. Sponsored by Da Vinci Clothing and Buddy Boy Entertainment, we are here live and direct with the one, the only, the legend, Mr. Octetti Brookshot, Ludi Rankin. We are live and direct. Um, with definitely uh, um, Dada. Yes, <laughs> the original Don Dada. Now, when, uh, listen, uh, listen, uh, listen, when it comes to off the cut radio, don't you ever bring no scare business to off the cut. You hear it from the roughest, toughest, Ross, Clark, Jamaican. Dude, um, and you said them scare business. There are lines in a movie that just set the tone, but when you said, but when you're sitting down with uh, Tommy and Belly and you say, don't them don't bring no scare business. I was like, that's Vinny, <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> we're we're just like, I mean, yo yo, okay. I think I think X want to shit himself, man. He was looking at me because I came so hard at him. Man. X look at me, I'm I said I was just I was just I was just. <laughs> I mean, you look. You deserve the Lifetime Achievement Hood Oscar just for that, because I mean, you know, that that was just. I mean, the way you delivered those lines. I mean, um, because the movie was straight serious. You know, uh, we're back on it, but uh, you know, but the movie was just straight so serious in terms of because the character. You know, I mean, you were the man that was basically, you know, the sh- you know, one of the shot callers. You know what I mean? You really. I you was the one. I was the only one. Everything that you see in Benny, Oklahoma, everything what's going on is coming from the ox. Yeah. Yeah, ox. You mean the you was running the whole? You was run- Yeah, you was basically running everything. I mean, and it's yeah. like to see that. You know, I mean, we. You know, you embody in that role, the essence of what the kingpin is, you know, the main man, the plug, you not only, you know, you're the power source, you know, you the whole enchilada, you know, in terms of what was going on. Matter of fact, if I can bring this reference in too, because you know exactly who I'm speaking of when I say his name, Christopher Dudius Coke, you know, a triple Yeah, Dudius, Dudius, my boy, Shawa. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, but I mean, you you channel that spirit, I mean, so heavily. But you know um, what? To be honest, with you, stop for a minute. Let me explain something right there. The reason why I can say those names, I can because the first record I ever released, it was the great leader of the Shower Posse. His name is Vivian Blake. Okay, I record for them Clay Pot label. I didn't even, the shower was not even exist yet. That was 1984. Shower was exist about 1989. 
Okay, when I when I'm, I'm know everything, man. I can speak these things because I'm a real G in this game, and I'm keeping real. I'm a celebrity that I do work. They hired me a lot. I did concert for them, so I know what I'm saying to you. My first two records is called. The first one was Up and Down. The second one was Dance After Ram. Was done for Clay Pot Label, which was owned by Vivian Blake, that the federal government charged as the leader of the shower posse. Then they charged Duduskoke, okay? Yep, so we get right. that clear. I got it. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, and that was, but I, I mean, but when you're looking at those, uh, but when you're looking at some of those names that you mentioned, I mean, these were serious guys. Um, well, yeah, so now what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say, though, I'm explaining, like, my characters that I play in movies, man, I'm for real with it. It's like I bring realness to character. Not saying I was doing it, but I seen it, I learned it, right. and I walked around it, I run around it, and I stomp on the ground with it. So, therefore, when I get on that screen, and that's why the world loves me so much. Every kid, because they, they see real stuff in me. There's a lot of movie I looked at and says, why actor cannot be like me and I even seen the movie good and it's all right and it's one Oscar award I seen a real movie that show reality that don't even win nothing not even a first award you kidding me with this game man it's crazy definitely because we're yeah, going to chop it up on what that. you brought to the table with your character is you could tell that you brought an essence to that character you brought that character to life behind the screen it don't seem like you just playing the guy or you just somebody just temporarily playing the guy. You, it's like you just brought that to Became device. that guy. Yeah. Exactly. What, what, what I brought, what I actually brought, because movies, you don't understand, people, like millions, like about 70%, uh, not well, but like 60% of people that love movie watch movie cry when things happen in movie. They take movie for real. So when you come and you bring that that fake character movie and they cry and hurt it so much, they are not getting the right message then. When you bring the right reality of what really happening in the streets, that's why I love movie that true stories because that's real. You understand? My movies, I come in character and I change your script. I'm not going to do your script. I'll watch it, but I will pertain to it. Pertain to it mean that I'm going to act to the written of the character, but I'm going to bring the reality of the character, which is real in life, because people look at movies. So if I can bring the real reality to the world like that, and people is accepting it and looking at it like that, that means I'm doing the right thing. Cause if, you, if you see me in belly and you want to do what I do in belly, then you're dumb. You understand? You're supposed to be smart to know that, hey, man, this man killed 35 people and boom, boom, boom. Hey, a girl cut his throat. <laughs> you're not, you, know, you know what I mean? You're going to prison, you're going to get the death penalty, whatever. You know what I mean? Because that's reality. So it's to teach people if you do the right thing. You feel it? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, you, now Jamaica has such, now of course Jamaica is known for its reggae roots, of course, with uh you know Peter Tosh, you know Bob Marley, the the legends, you know Jimmy Cliff. Um, where was the transition really coming in terms of when dance hall was really beginning to come to prominence? Because that's of course when you would have later acts like Patra, Chevelle Franklin, um, you know. You know, just so many, you know, Shelly Thunder, uh, it just, um, of course, you know, Sh- uh, Shaka Demas and Flyers. Um, where, what, about what time was it really, or was it always there, or pretty much was there a point in time where the rhythm, you know, started changing and it really began to be more hip hop oriented going into the 90s? Uh, 2000, the millennium, when the millenniums jumped in. It mm-hmm. started changing, yeah. The 90s, the 80s, the 70s, the 80s, and 90s is hardcore, that's all. Um, but the reason why I think that happened, though, and I have nothing bad to say about it, I appreciate that. A lot of hip-hop 
artists who start collaborating with us, so we have to put it like crossover. As a matter of fact, I did start crossover because typewriter, when I did it with track masters, it was crossover hip hop, you know, so it started a while, but it get exposed real big in the when the millennium jumps in because even if you listen to Nicki Minaj, she do a lot of reggae dance on track and but they crossed over though. You know what I mean? They're not fully, but they it still have hardcore reggae one drop beat inside of it. Yeah, because I mean, uh, of course, yourself, Bougie Bonton, Mega Bonton, Mad Cobra. I mean, you know that. You know, we're all older. You know, me and King are older, so we remember that era. But we just sometimes just reminisce on it, and we're just thinking to ourselves, damn, we are never going to see another era like that again. That was a- oh, yes, that's, that's you, yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yes, you will, because guess what? I'm back in the studio. Album done. Yeah. Yes, you will. Okay, oh, yes, yes. And that's, a, and that's a perfect segue. So tell us about the new project that you got coming. What did you yeah, have man, it's it's coming? Tell us about it. Oh, man, it's amazing. I mean, I did album, I did songs before, but I believe this album is one of the best that I've done. And I never planned to do another album, but I was pressured by my fans and my people and my agencies and everybody that around me. They said, you are loving too much in the streets. You've got to put music back to these people and let these young kids also know where you was coming from. From. So I, I, I return with an album coming out. It's, it's dropping soon. It's called Return of the Dan Dada. Yeah. Mm. Man, and look, I see let one y'all song, know. And I, want, and I wanted to ask you this here. I seen one song where you went at a guy, went at the um, Post Malone, and I want to know that like, what triggered that? Like, did you see this guy do a bad commercial, or you just heard his music? It was just like it was just some bullshit. Like, what made you want to go at that cat? Well, I go at a lot of people, man. Yeah, if you look at my website, I, I he's like, I am like for real, man. I'm here like I'm here to build star, not kill stars, eh? And I, I there's a lot of artists that don't even ever star, a lot of celebrities that hyped up in themselves and they grow up with a lot of kids. And I'm not gonna call a few names, you know, like a uh, big artist in Canada. Never done anything really for artists. Is he just have them around them, him and all that? I'm not gonna call your names. I I will I will call out people. I call out Jay Z. I call out Beyonce, man, when they had that baby and Jay Z talking about he want three million dollars for his baby picture, man. I got mad and I blasted out. It went viral. I don't know if you heard about it. It's called a gangster view. You know what I mean? I said, yo, everybody got kids, man. We all love our kids. What the fuck you think your kid's so special that you $3 million for one picture? I'm not charging people. You yeah. understand? I would not buy your baby picture for $3 million. I'll take that $3 million to the hood in Brownsville, the project in Brooklyn, and flip it. Yeah, come on, man. Definitely. I mean, that's real, really? man. Um, game because, right you know, and he, and he got mad at me because I know Jay-Z all his life because I used to run Brooklyn, so I know him from Marcy's and stuff. And he did his album, and he go talk about my nigga got mad about my baby. I didn't get mad about your baby. I got mad about you, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, if you're listening, you can call in one six one nine nine two four zero seven zero three, and you can respond. <laughs> You know, the, the line, line is open. Is focused. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely, um, in terms of it, because the DNA of, you know, of what you've done, you know, because even though the albums are almost at their 30-year mark, it shows the timelessness of which your classic contributions are still there today. Um, as King mentioned earlier, and we still haven't gotten to the shadows, but we're gonna get to that. But we, but we gotta get to this. How did the Gucci Mane um, collaboration come about? Uh, uh, well, um, I was affiliated with some people in Atlanta, Big Chat Records, um, mm-hmm. and I, I, I went there dealing with some stuff when I went to Atlanta. I didn't, I know the. Um, I know Big Meech, 
Um, I know him, and I know, um, and I didn't know Young Jeezy, but I know Big Meech, and I know Big Cat. They were two, like, two done people that run in two different labels. One was, I think, BMF. And BMF, BMF. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, and then one was Big Cat Records. So I went to Big Cat Studio and the label in the office one day. And Gucci covered I was there, Gucci man, and he was like, he was he was kind of hot in the street on the ground. And, um, now this is going back to 2005 came, with the Trap House album. Yeah, right? yeah, he came, yeah, he came to the studio because Big Cat signed him at that time for like temporary contract or whatever, doing recording there and stuff like that. He came to yes, the sir. studio because yes, he heard he heard he heard I was there. You understand? The day before that, I was with Big Meech and them at a, a car show. Um, then I came to Big Chat the next day, and um, um, Gucci came down there. And um, he said, yo, I needed to get him this song, man, because I'm getting this. But at that time, actually, I know Big Meech, but I'm never familiar with Young Jeezy, you know what I mean? You know, I know about him, but I didn't really care. So he told me that... Um, I want you to drop a gangster song for me. But I didn't know he was talking about Young Jeezy. So they right. make me go do, they I, they, I, they make me do like uh, a serious hook on that plus verse. So they let me record first. But at the meantime, I was doing gangster song at that time. So I said, all right, you know what? I just went on the end and started saying, killing this and then I kill them for fun, you know? And, um, and do it, and Gucci man came on. After I left, Gucci never recorded that day. I just did my part. I left, went back to New York City. When I went back to New York City, Gucci man called me and says, check your email. Uh, and check my email or whatever, and I checked it, and I, I listened to this song. And then I heard the song, and I heard... Gucci in the song says, my mama ain't raised no bitch ass nigga. Never heard Gucci man no snitch ass nigga. And rather did it, rather did it, did it, rather did it. Tell young Jeezy the last bell Jeezy. I said, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I said, yo, I said, this man put me in the middle of a bad situation. <laughs> you know so I, uh, You know, I tried to expect all that. So then I got a call from young Jeezy. Young Jeezy want me to come down in the studio. Yo, man, you better come straight in this out. I need to come call the rock and feature something with me talking about this being this and all that, all that, man. I just leave it alone. Next thing Gucci and Big Cat them do, they start promoting the hell out of that shit, man. I don't, you know, so. Yeah, and you know, yeah. you know I got paid. I, but but it, it was something I got paid to do. So, you know, I mean, it's my job, man. I had, you know, so. And I'm right. glad Young Jesus didn't take it personal. Me and Young Jesus is cool as hell today, man. We cool, you know, and all that. Very good, good guy, good guy. That's, Jesus is a friend that's of mine. Um, that that whole crew. Shout out to CTE, you know, Corporate Thugs Entertainment. Um, I've had the pleasure of hanging out with those guys on more than one occasion. You know, Jeezy, you know, Rossini, you know, all those guys. Real good guys. You know, stand up individuals. Um, and I, and it's and you know it's you know that was a very eye opening uh piece you gave us, you know, Mr. Rankin, because that's something that a lot of people didn't know in terms of your part in it, in terms of, you know, how you kind of came in because, you know, that time. Yeah, because a lot, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot a lot of people was thinking that I was on um, Gucci's side, like I choose Gucci to war against Young Jeezy, and it wasn't so, and and the big bosses them know that, and it was no problem there, but you know what I mean? Because I communicate with young Jeezy right now more than I ever communicate with Gucci. I do communicate with Gucci, and Gucci's cool with me, but, you know, I'm just only trying to get that clear out there. It was not nothing like that with me, with a rival against um, young Jeezy. Never, ever. Right. Like Michael, like Michael Corleone said, it was just business. It wasn't personal. You know, it wasn't uh, personal. You know, it was business. Yeah, I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah, I'm glad you cleared that up. Yeah, I was yeah. like a 15-year myth. 
Africa. I was like, yeah, well, you, you, well at that time, you, at that time, you heard, you heard what they said, what, 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 what um, Gucci and um, Jesus saying, uh, put 10 stock. That's what I got to do, what I did, 10 stock. So I guess that's what they were talking about. Yeah. Yeah, for the side um, hook. They gave me 10 stock to do the hook. So I do the hook for 10 stock, yeah. Yeah, um, that issue between, That's you know, for those that know that history, for those that know that history between Jeezy and Gucci, um, you know, uh, it's unlikely those two are ever going to get that situation resolved. Um, there, there's, you know, it's no need to go into it ad nauseum over the air. All three of us know what happened in terms of the situations that led up and, you know, what continued throughout the time. And uh, that's just a very personal issue between both of those guys, you know. Uh, from a long time, issue. kids' days, from kids' days, man. But yeah, they grown now. They are grown men now. And I think that that's all, that's all dying, man. That's dead, man, yeah. Right. Definitely. It's dead. It's dead. Um, it's dead, man. Yeah, yeah they're yeah. trying to get money. Now, now. we got... Yeah, and the thing is, is you know, um, and I think a lot of times in the game, because we talk about this a lot in terms of where competition, because you spoke, you know, uh, just so candidly about the rivalries that you had with other, you know, Jamaican artists, but of course it was never to the point of violence. There was never a threat of violence ever. Um, we've seen situations with artists throughout the years in music where uh, art, began to, or the life began to imitate the art that they were spitting on wax, and sometimes the art imitated the life. But you had a lot of, you know, guys on wax who couldn't quite understand that what you say, what you do, carries consequences when you disrespect somebody on a microphone, and they do take it personally. And there are a thousand stories and more that we've seen of, you know, these casualties. Um, as you as an elder statesman, as the Don Dada, the top shot of, you know, one of the legendary uh, luminaries of the culture. Um, what is your feeling in terms of how artists need to handle these situations more as professionals rather than take it to the street level? No, no. Well, it's not how you know, artists angle the situation. It's something, a message I will tell to artists because you know what the problem is? Artists start the game and they get two records out there, artists in the game go on stage and the crowd go hype for them. Artists in the game do not look at the artists that has the fame and making that fortune and out there. Artists that getting jealous and start problem because what it is, it's all jealousy, man. That's what it all is, man. Okay? The mm -hmm. whole thing is about how I'm better than you. But yet still the one that's saying I'm better than you, the one that he's saying is better than is making platinums and they run into each other and start and all that, that ignorance, man. That's dumb, illiteracy, and stupid. And I'm glad none of these artists don't bring that to me because I'm not the one, eh? Because I see it every day, every day, and it makes me so mad, man. You understand? It's not just hip-hop. It's Jamaican, Trinidadian artists, man. Artists get too hype. And in Jamaica, we have a whole time saying never sick. Come sick. You know what that is? You never have a chain, but you get one. And when you get that chain now, you think that you're better than the man that can't even afford one. Chill. Have a coke and a smile. Have a nap because <laughs> your brain messed up. Yeah. <laughs> That's that gangster wizard right there, you know, because I love it how you flipped it on that old Kenny Rogers chorus of no, on the gambler, know when to hold him, know when to fold him. There you, there you go. Why are you, so, why are you so smart? That's where I take it from. I just changed the whole melody. Yeah, yeah. I said, know what you're saying. Know who so you're dissing. Watch what, what you're talking. And remember, the yeah. Dandada with the gun is coming. Yeah, Yeah, man. So we definitely got to get Oh, to this oh, because... you know what? You know oh, what? Uh, I forgot to tell you. I have to get on a plane, eh? I might have to leave you alone in a few minutes, man. 
okay. It's okay because we're gonna get we're gonna. Cause we're yeah, gonna go with the I, you know, I have to get to first. Toronto like on that spot in five minutes because I get a I get a. But it's a private plane though. They wait for me, eh? you know. And so, so I'm okay, I gotta so go just... like I gotta get to Edmonton. You know what I mean? I have to appear there tonight. So it takes like about oh, a man. couple of hours to get there. Yeah. So we're gonna make this quick because okay, uh, okay. we don't want to hold up your flight. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Well, well, I appreciate it, though. I guess what? You know what? I'm going to tell you this right now. I did so many interviews, and I've been doing interviews. This is one of the longest that I did, and I'm comfortable, and I'm happy, and I'm glad to speak. And I'm loving the questions you all asking me. That's why I don't have a problem with it. And I will do it again and again and again, man. Come on. Look, man, we're, we're so happy to have you. We're honored. Yeah, we are honored yeah, to have yeah, you yeah. with us. Um, yeah. The Shadas. Now, how did that happen? My favorite because... right here. Yes. No, nah, I mean, yeah, Shadas was a problem, man. It's like, I mean, when I say problem, the movie was so good. It was so fun doing. But I was like one of the craziest character. Um, Sprague Benz was a nutcase. You know, Paul Campbell as <laughs> Mad Max. Shatters had all of us the most sickest thing. Shatters was crazy, man. It's like, uh, it is. This is a nutcase movie, man. It's a cult movie. It's gangster, eh? I'm, yo, man, it's, I don't even know yeah. what to tell you about Shatters, man. You know, because I, I, I know. All I can tell you, all I can tell you, Shatters is like the, the movie for the streets, eh? Yeah. It was, and it's crazy with the story because it also, in addition to the cast, because it also had, the Mar- you know, it had a couple of the Marleys, you know, of course, and and then some guy, you know, who was gonna, who was known as Beat Novocaine at the time. I think you know him by the name of DJ Khaled. You know, he. Was oh, that's my well. boy, man. I do a lot. I do a lot of work with him. Yeah. Yeah, um, because the uh, the story, as I heard it, was shot as was. It was originally shot in 1998. But there, you know, but no, it didn't really no, get... no, shot, no, Shatters was shot in 2002. Okay, it was shot in 2002 because I heard it was shot earlier, but it didn't get out until 2002. Okay, no, it, no, no, remember, I'm one of the major, I'm the major, I'm one of the, I'm one of the major star in the movie. That movie was shot 2002 in Miami gotcha, and Jamaica. Gotcha. Okay, all right. So we're clearing it. All right, so we cleared it. So it was really it yeah. was shot in two thousand two. What was the issues yeah. in terms of uh, why it took so long to finally get the uh, proper release for? Because I think it was in two thousand and six. That's when it really hit. Yeah, because um, because the, the, the I can say it clear. I want you to put it out there because I ain't scared. The writer and the director Seth Silveria is a thief. And he also, the man that put out most of the money on that movie ended up died, and he take ownership of that movie. This guy ended oh, wow. up in court getting, he ended up in court getting sued from different angles because he did not spend any money. It wasn't his money to do it, man. He's a thief. And they tried to do part two, trying to get me into all that, man. And I asked for stupid millions because I want them to stay away from me, eh? That guy's a thief, man. Yeah. Man, but I mean, but like you said, but I'm okay. You know what I mean? I'm different, but I'm just telling you what people had to go through with this guy, eh? Yeah, but it's crazy because in terms of the culture, because it's one thing, you know, when we interview, you know, Jermaine Hopkins, you know, you know, of course from Lean on Me, you know, but we when we talk to him, you know, and you know about he did Lean on Me, you know, but then he ended up doing Juice, and he had two iconic roles. You ended up nailing two like universally acclaimed iconic roles. You know, with Ox and then Teddy Brooks. I mean, you know how? I mean, how do you just? I mean, that I'm just speechless in terms of how you were able to just pull the double whammy to be involved in two legendary projects that are still today considered to be, you know, uh, the 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 just a cornerstone of hip hop cinema. Like when Bob Marley says the I got tired for Simon Fierce, that's me. When DJ Khaled says I am the one, ah, that's me. I am the one. I am that one. That's all I could say and they all know it. I am that one. 
can't they can't find another one but me. I am that one. Man, look, there, there's only and if one they do, if they, if if they do, I'm gonna be so happy because I want to see somebody be somebody like me. But as now, I am that one, and they will always come to me like the real producers, the real. Um, the real industry, the real people will always come to me, and that's what's happening now because they know I am that one. You know, I don't worry about the shutters no more. It was done, and I did my job, and I put my trademark on it. You understand? I don't worry about Belly because that's my favorite movie, and I know if Hype is doing anything, Hype is going to find me when it pertaining to that type of character. I know a lot of people and producers, man, because I am that one. You know what I mean? And I'm humble, and I'm out here. I don't act stupid, even though I drive nice cars like Phantom, Rolls Royce, and stuff, because I like nice things. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, no, yeah, that's look, Phantom look, was look, fly. Look, the one that you posted on the ground, on the ground that's one of the flyest <laughs> Phantoms I've seen. It's, I, it's right here in my driveway. I'm, I'm sitting beside it right oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's I, love it. I love it. I love. It. I got the top drop too right now because I'm about to just bounce this to the airport, yo. Man, but I tell you, yep. in terms of it, you you've been yeah. blessed because in terms yeah. of how you have been, you know, through the albums and through the music, and I mean, look on your on your Facebook, it says Screen Act Screen Actors Guild, and I tell anybody. Well, that's what that I am. I'm a union part. member. Yes, when you get that yes. card, I tell anybody, you are official once you get that card. <laughs> I mean, I have, <laughs> card since, I have that card since 1998, man. Count that years. Man. But, but, uh, wait, uh, oh, man. That's taking good care of your whip right there. It showed appreciation over time. It looked, like, it looked better than a lot of these new whips these young cats is pushing. Man, man, nobody can. You know how much for that car, man? It's a million change, man. Come on, man. You you, you saw the blue one? The, uh, yo, yo, did you saw that demo, the, the the M series? I put it on my Instagram. I just copped that one. Man. Yo, I need that one, man. I need to get my weight up and get that. <laughs> I, I hit the like button earlier. I said, yo, I need that one, especially for the weekend coming. <laughs> all right, well, you go, I'm all right, you come see me One day I just invite you to come see me And I say go fucking roam the street, man Go ahead Look, look, we're gonna, look, we're gonna do belly in real life Just, uh, you know We're just gonna live the, the fly lifestyle <laughs> But we got the after effect yeah, Oh, man. you know what? I got, yo, I gotta go, man I gotta go, I gotta go Okay Fuck. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yo, all right, right, me, man. Must love yo, man. I love y'all, man. And big up all the people and man that listen to y'all, man. Must love from the original Jamaican and and y'all will hear me up on this buzz again, yo. Definitely, look. Whenever you want to come back, just let us know. Much love, massive. You know, one love to the islands. We love you. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. and y'all look. Tell you. them look out for the. Uh, I want y'all look out for that new album, man. Let them know that it's coming, man. I don't know the drop date, but it's coming very soon. Probably in September, the ending of October, sometime there, man. The return of the band. Let them know that. Yeah, yeah we'll we're gonna definitely be bring here, you back around then. Then to talk about it. Aye, yeah. aye. As a matter of fact, I'm going to hit you all up when I come back. When I got some time, I'm going to talk to Prince Kennedy, and I'm going to have him set up a time. I'm going to call you all back again, man. I'll ask you all. Okay, now, one brother. love. I repeat. Thank you, thank you. Much love and respect. All right. I have a master